made us fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness, translated us into the kingdom of the dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. To the praise of God's glory, wherein we have been accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of God's grace. And why this is so important is because Paul emphasizes thanks as being so important in our prayer life. In the book of Colossians, in four little, chapter, uh, four little chapters, he talks about how important it is to be thankful and thanksgiving. And he says it five times in just four chapters. Ephesians also talks because they're sister epistles. So look in uh, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 3. This is just a little highlight before we get into the main lesson. In Colossians 1, 3, it says, We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. He's talking to the saints. And in Ephesians 1.12, the, the passage I just said that I start my prayer life with, giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us fit or meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. When you go to Colossians chapter 2, and... Uh, Verse 7, we'll look at this verse later on. Rooted and built up in him, talking about Christ, and established in the faith as we have been taught, abounding therein, what? With thanksgiving. You go to Colossians chapter 3 and look at verse uh, 15. And this is important to our lesson today. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye what? thankful. And then in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 2, he tells you and I, as he tells the Colossians, continue in prayer and watch in the same with what? Thanksgiving. thanksgiving. So thanks is so important because we've been given everything. And remember in the past I told you sometimes it's really important that you can take the book of Ephesians and you can look at the three W's and you can sum up so much of what we are in the body of Christ. And Paul sums up Colossians in, uh, excuse me, Ephesians in those three W's. In Colossians 1, uh, yeah, in Ephesians 1, 2, and 3, he talks about our wealth, all the blessings that we have in Christ. We've already been seated in the heavenlies. We are a saint. We've been sanctified by God. So Ephesians 1 through 3 is all about our wealth. When we get to Ephesians 4 and 5, it's all about our walk. We are to walk worthy of our calling. We are to walk in love. We are to walk in light because we were darkness, but now we are light. And we are to walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. And then in Ephesians chapter 6, it talks about our warfare. And our warfare is, of course, the word of God in Ephesians 6. And we have the sword of the Spirit. Uh, which is the Word of God. We have a defensive weapon, and it is an offensive weapon. So sometimes that's so easy to, uh, to look at a, an epistle of Paul and divide it into, this, into d those segments. So anyways, now, if we look at this word church, is where the confusion starts. Because everybody thinks there's one church, and it's the church that, God said, that Christ said in Matthew 16, I will build my church. So everybody talks there, and that's why then they start the church with Peter. And we have a church out there who emphasizes that and think that they have people who are the successors of Peter. So we're going to look at that word. That word church, and I know this is not new, this is a review, is simply the word ekklesia in the Greek. And all it means is a called-out group. And there are many called-out groups in the Word of God. So, But we're looking at the Christ body is the church today. And we're going to look at five aspects here. We're, we're going to show that it began with Paul and not with Peter, which is very important. We're going to show it as a joint body composed of Jews and Gentiles alike, which is no difference, which wasn't true when Christ was here on earth, wasn't true when Peter spoke at Pentecost, when he says, ye men of Israel, ye men of Judah, to all the house of Israel I am speaking. The next thing, the third one, is so important because it's made up of reconciled Jews and Gentiles. And we'll see how that reconciled word is so important to understand that body truth. 
The fourth thing is the body of Christ is the one new man and the new creation. And the fifth thing to understand about this body, it was God's purpose concerning the body which was kept secret, as Paul tells us, since before the foundation of the world until revealed to our apostle, which is Paul. So we'll look at those five aspects. But as far as the church then, it simply means a called out group. And he has different called out groups in the word of God. Let's look at Acts 7.38, please. And I know you know a lot of these verses, but it also should be helpful if somebody picks this up on YouTube and listens to it to see it's why it's important to see that there's not just one church. And we know this is Stephen talking in Acts 7, and he's given a history to the nation Israel and how they have always rejected the Holy Spirit and talks about their history uh, with, uh, in uh, the time that God was dealing with them. But look at Acts 7, 38, and actually I'll start with verse 37. This is that Moses, this is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, so we know who he's speaking to, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the, what? Church in the wilderness, they called out group, which the angel which spake to him in Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto me. So, of course, that prophet that he will raise up is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Christ talks about that. So go back to Matthew chapter 18 and verse 1. And why I'm taking you to verse 1, the verses we're going to talk about are later in the chapter, but it's always important to understand who he is talking to. And he's talking specifically to the 12, to his apostles not talking to us, the body of Christ, not even talking to the general people that he's talking specifically because the disciples are going to ask him a very important question in verse 1. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Right away, this causes a confusion and a problem, thinking that when he talks about the kingdom of heaven, he's talking about a kingdom in the heavens. But as you and I realize, the kingdom of heaven is what is going to be set up on this earth. Do we have verses in the Old Testament that confirms this of where this kingdom of heaven will be? And I gave you this verse in the past. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 11. And when we get there, if somebody would read that, I'd appreciate it. Verse 21. Deuteronomy 11, 21. So we don't have to be confused by those who say, see, everything that was physical to the Jews now has become spiritual. And when Christ says, my kingdom is not of this world, he has changed that to a heavenly program and to a spiritual program. But we know very clearly that, that in the Psalms it says he promised to David that he would not alter that covenant that he made with, or change it in any way. He would not break it. So all those physical things they offered that has to do with the land, and that's why that verse is so important. It says where? In the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. Go back to verse 10, the first three words. For the land. Look at the first three words of verse 11. But the land which we go to possess it. Verse 12. The land which the Lord thy God careth for. So very clearly we're talking about a kingdom on earth that's going to be part of a land that was promised to a people, the nation Israel, to possess it. And it's the land of milk and honey. We didn't go to that verse, but that's also in, in, in chapter 11. Go to Psalms chapter 89, and it talks about the seed also, which of course the seed of David is the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to Psalms ch chapter 89. And uh, if somebody likes to read, if they would read verses 25 through 29, please, of Psalms 89.
my God and the rock of my salvation. Also I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy will keep him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. His seed also will I make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. So again we see there that, and who is David's seed? We know it's the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah that Israel rejected. So very clearly, I love it, his throne as the days of heaven. But where will the throne? He's already sitting on a throne today in the heavens at the right hand of God the Father. But we're talking about the earthly throne that when he comes at his second coming, he is going to sit upon David's throne, his earthly father. And it says it will be like his throne as the days of heaven. Now, why I took you there, because look at verse 34 to those people that say now it's spiritual and what Christ did was change it. Well, then it makes God a liar, because look at verse 34. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is going out of my lips. Once have I, once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven, Shelah. And that word Shelah, I looked it up, I just wanted to know for myself, because it's used so much in the Psalms, and it really is trying to accentuate the importance of what has been said before. That was a Hebrew word, so that's simply what it means. It, it's simply is telling us that we should pause and reflect on what has just been stated. And that's what we just read about this covenant that I made with David. Now, so go back to Matthew. So the problem that we have, and there's a church out that uses this constantly in Matthew chapter 16. And the question that was asked by the Lord Jesus Christ in verse uh, 15, he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter's going to answer. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, but for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto you, but my Father, which is in heaven. And I say unto, also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom, and that's what Peter has, the keys of the kingdom, which he, was what Pentecost is all about. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So we know there's a church out there that thinks now that they have people that have the ability to do that. But very quickly, that was given to a specific group of people, to the disciples, with Peter as a leader. But when he says, I will build my church, and it's upon this rock, the only rock that we have in the Word of God is the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter cannot be the rock. If you go back to Deuteronomy, it's very clear who that the Jehovah is the rock, and Jesus Christ, of course, is the Jehovah of the Old Testament. So this is where the problem starts, when it says, I will build my church, and they think there is only one church. But we have just noticed very clearly that it's simply a called out group and Israel was the church in the wilderness. Now, where did this church start that Christ talks about, I will build my church? And of course, that's a Pentecost. So to go to Acts chapter 2, and there's two key verses here. Okay, so now we see this church, and we see that the, what's going to happen. Look at verse 41. I'm not going to read all the verses, but look at 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, water baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So in this church that started at Pentecost, 3,000 souls are added. Now go down to verse 47, and it talks about it, praising God, and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the, what? Church. church daily, such as should be saved. So the problem has to be is, yes, this is the church that God, the Christ talked about in Matthew. I will build my 
church, that kingdom church that's going to be set up on earth with Peter as the leader of the twelve. And right away, 3,000 souls are brought into this called out group at Pentecost. But the problem that we have is what we know is Peter never talks anything about the church, which is his body. And we'll talk about this a little more when we get to Paul. You do not, but so what is he talking about when he talks about very clearly what Christ promised Israel was everything that Deuteronomy 11 talks about. This kingdom is going to set up on earth that's going to be such a blessing, and not just to Israel, but to all the nations who are going to be blessed through the rise of Israel, which Isaiah 60 talks about. It's never a mystery that Gentiles should be saved. That's the problem that we have. It's a mystery on how Gentiles should be saved. According to Isaiah 60 and prophecy, Israel, the Gentiles are going to be saved through the rise of Israel. But when we start to look at Romans 11, which we'll look at, Today, it's Gentiles being saved, as you and I know, through the fall of Israel. That's what the mystery is all about. Prophecy never talked about that in every time. So it's never a mystery that Gentiles should be saved. It's how Gentiles will be saved. The mystery that was revealed to Paul through the fall of Israel. So very clearly, this church is a called out group. And it has to do with an earthly kingdom where Christ sits upon David's throne, where the 12 are going to sit on 12 thrones, according to Matthew 19, 28, and they're going to judge the 12 tribes of Israel. And then the whole nation of Israel will become a kingdom of priests. And they'll take that so-called great commission of Matthew to all the nations. So we can see how important it is when we rightly divide the word of God what that church is all about. It is a kingdom church, a a church that starts at Pentecost to a nation Israel. That's why Peter talks very specifically, ye men of Judah, ye men of Israel, to the whole house of Israel. Nothing about Gentiles, only Jews and proselytes. You cannot start the church, the body of Christ, at a Jewish feast day. And that's what Pentecost is all about. So very clearly, we can see from this thing, that by taking and saying there is one church and starting it as Christ said, I will build my church in Matthew 16, is where all the confusion starts. So what we have to understand is, how do we know again with Paul and not with Peter? Because until you get to Paul's epistles, you will not see that term, the church which is body, in any part of Scripture. Nothing in the Old Testament. Nothing in Christ's earthly ministry because he was a minister of the circumcision according to Matthew 15, 8. Paul tells us that very clearly. And it's not mentioned at Pentecost, at Peter. So very clearly, we have scripture that tells us not until you get to Paul do you see that term, the church, which is his body. And we'll look at that term when we look at many passages and things. So that's the first thing to know of what we know about Christ's body, which is the one body today. The second thing that Paul talks about, and let's look at that, and I want to get the verses so I'm not getting, losing my thought here. The church which is body. So it is not mentioned, as we say, that's the first point in Scripture until you get to the Apostle Paul. And let's look at two passages here. Let's go to Colossians. Chapter 2 and verse 17, please. And if somebody will read that, I'll appreciate it. So very clearly we have a key statement there. The body is of Christ. That's how simple. Till you get to Paul's epistles, you will not see that anywhere else. You take Paul's epistles out of the word of God and you'll know nothing about the church, which is his body. It's not mentioned. But yet for some reason, they just want to assume things about Christ's earthly ministry and Peter's message at Pentecost and put that body there, which it is not. Because they don't want to study the scripture. They just want to use it in a way to confirm their religious beliefs. And that's true of almost any denomination. And almost every denomination, even our fundamentalist brothers, want to start the church, the party of Christ at Pentecost. And then it would be starting with Peter, and of course, they're not with Paul. Look at Colossians chapter 3 
And look at verse 15, if somebody will read that, please. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you are also called in one body, and be thankful. So there it is again, Paul is emphasized. You are called in one body. And that body, of course, is the body of Christ. That is the church of today. It's a physical, a spiritual organ, a organism. It's not an organization. There's a church out there that has a key city, and they have ambassadors that come to there, and there are government and so forth. That's what it's not about. The body of Christ is a spiritual organism, not an organization, not a religious organization, not a denomination. That's all man-made. So very clearly, now why is the second point so important? It's a joint body, because as we know from Scripture, until we get to Paul's epistles, Israel is always special. They always have a preference. There's always a bias toward the nation Israel, and a Gentile has to, and that's why Christ said very clearly to that Gentile woman, there is a difference. You are a dog, and I come to the children. She got a blessing simply because she understood and agreed with him. I know that's truth, Lord. I know I'm a dog. I'll take the crumbs from the table of the children. So there's a preference there. But only when you get to the joint body of Christ, when you get to that joint body, and look, let's go to Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 6. This is new. This is part of what Paul's revelation is all about. And if somebody will read verse, um, I hope I have the right verse, verse 6, please. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. And then read 7 because it helps too. Whereof I am made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body. So right now we have a joint body where there is no difference. This is so important to understand. It's composed of Jews and Gentiles alike, no difference. Now Paul says, I am the apostle to the Gentiles. I magnify mine office. Now what's important today to understand is, even though it's Jews and Gentiles alike, it's very hard to have a Jew come into this body. But in a sense, it's just the opposite it was before. A Gentile had to become a Jew when God was dealing with Israel. Today, in a sense, a Jew has to become a Gentile, in a sense. But Jews, and the important thing is that it's a joint body, and it's composed of both Jews and Gentiles, even though most of the church is all Gentiles. Very few Jews, because Israel has been what? Blinded and set aside for a season. So very clearly, that joint body is what Paul talks about, which is brand new. And Paul, as you remember, was a Pharisee. And when he was a Pharisee, he would have had nothing to do with the Gentiles. Gentiles were dogs. If, they, if, if a Gentile even touched the garment, they would have to go to a spiritual washing because they did not touch the Gentile. But the change is when Paul gets his revelation to see this beautiful truth that today in this body, there is no difference between that Jew and the Gentile. The third thing is the most important, I think, because it's made up of reconciled Jews and Gentiles. And that reconciled is so important because to be reconciled, what has to be first be noticed? You have to be alienated and you have to be an enemy. So let's look at that again. To be reconciled, you have to be alienated, and you have to be an enemy. Now, when did that happen to the Gentiles? No one? Yeah, but especially Gentiles, it would have been in Genesis 11. In Genesis 11, before he calls out Abraham, all Gentiles at that time become alien, and he calls out one man who was a Gentile. A Hebrew means one who crossed over. And he said, now I'm going to bless all the nations who have been alienated through one nation, and that will be through Abraham's seed. But the problem we have to understand to get this is, when was Israel made an enemy and alienated? Now, we know about the Gentiles. Go to Ephesians chapter 2.
And uh, if somebody will read uh, verse 12, please, in Ephesians chapter 2. Now, this is Gentiles in time past, which was true when Christ, of course, was here on earth. But at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Can you be in any worse condition than that? Look at the five things there. You and I as Gentiles in time past. And we know God's word is divided between in time past, but now, and in ages to come. And Ephesians talks about that. But at that time, when? In time past. Go back to verse 11, which I should have read. Therefore remember that ye be in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision of the flesh made by hand. That at that time, in time past, you were without Christ. One, you were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Two, you were strangers from the covenant of promise that was given to David that we just read about, having no hope and without God in the world. You can't be in a worse condition than that. So that's the condition there, but that wasn't true of Israel. So to have this program and to have this body of Christ being there, Israel has to be alienated. Israel has to become an enemy. And that's what, of course, Romans 11 is all about. So go to Romans chapter 11. And if somebody is listening to this tape, if uh, understanding Romans 11 will help you understand the beauty of God's word and understand how important to take God's word and rightly divide it. <coughs> so in Romans 11, and look starting in verse 25, please. We're going to go from 25 through 33. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. I've always wondered why it was important to state that, that you should not be ignorant. Because 90-some percent of even believers are ignorant of this mystery. They may be saved because they see Paul's gospel message but they do not write about it. So it was important to Paul to start out, I think, very clearly, I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Now, this is the fullness of the Gentiles spiritually, which is what our program is all about. When you go back to Luke 21, it talks about the time of the Gentiles politically. Now, I'm in a little disagreement with, I don't know, maybe even some here, because I've heard even some of the say that we are now in the time of the Gentiles politically and spiritually. I do not believe that. The time of the Gentiles politically is the last time that the Gentiles will control the land of Israel. And today it doesn't matter who's in charge of that land. We know we have a conflict there now, but it has nothing to do with what God's program is all about. Because the only reason that Israel is, the land is holy, the only reason that the city of Jerusalem was the holy city is because God resided there in a place. He said, I want you to build me a place, a temple where he resided. He doesn't reside there anymore. So the last time of the Gentiles politically will be during the time of Antichrist, which talks about what, Daniel's, uh, what Daniel talks about in, Dan in Daniel 11. So the time of the Gentiles politically will take place during the time of Jacob's trouble, the last time that the Gentiles rule the land of Israel and the holy city. But today, when he says, till the fullness of the Gentiles become in, he's talking about the completion of this program, the program that was given to Paul, the dispensation of the grace of God that is given to Paul to give to you and I. The mystery, this program of the church, which is his body. So this is the conclusion. Let's continue. But now what will happen to those who say that we are spiritual Israel? And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer. That's the second coming. And shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And we know Jacob's name was changed to Israel. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, here's the key. This is no one. Peter never says this. Christ doesn't say this on earth. They are what? Enemies for your sake. 
but it's touching the election. They are beloved for the Father's sake. We do have an election of those that were saved under that program, those 3,000 souls and all that, but they did not get the kingdom. But the key is they are enemies for your sakes. 29, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance, without change, meaning everything he promised Israel has to be fulfilled. For as ye in time past have not believed God, talking about Gentiles, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. Who's that? Who's unbelief? Israel. Israel. So very clearly you can see, not till you get to Paul, do you see that Israel is an enemy, that Israel is alienated. That's why this word is so important, because this body of Christ is made of, of reconciled. And to be reconciled, you have to be at one time been an enemy, and you had to be been alienated. And that wasn't true of Israel until you get to the dispensation in a day. Because it had to be, it could not be until Israel rejected the Messiah that came to them and said, we will not have this king rule over us. When Israel rejected that kingdom by rejecting the king, the crucified Lord Jesus Christ, that Peter says very clearly, this man that you have crucified has been, is now made Lord and Messiah. And many came, but of course the leaders did not. And eventually they committed the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit and they could not have their kingdom. All sins against the Son of Man will be forgiven. Christ did that. But the sin against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. The twelve came in the power of the Holy Spirit to show this kingdom message that would be coming. So this word is so important. So you cannot have the church which is body until Israel has been made an enemy, until Israel has been alienated. And that doesn't happen until the Apostle Paul in his revelation of the mystery. Now, why is this important? Because all we have to do is go back to verse 15 and to see why this is true. So if somebody will read verse 15 of chapter 11, please. But if the past of the old world be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? That's the first time this truth is presented. And it's not presented to get to Paul. Peter doesn't say that at Pentecost. Christ never said anything about that in the earthly ministry. But that verse is the key to understand this wonderful mystery program. Let's read it again in verse 15. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? So Israel had to be cast away. And by them casting away, we have this wonderful truth of the body of Christ, the church, which is his body. The fourth thing to remember is this body of Christ is the one new man and a new creation. Why is this so important? Well, let's look at the verses. Go to Ephesians 2, 14 and 15, please. If somebody will read that in Ephesians 2, 14 and 15. So very clearly, this is something new here. Paul talks about the, this church was a body. We are the one new man. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 16 and 17. And if somebody will read that, please. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. We that we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, what is so important to understand that? Because, and please, I'm, I'm maybe getting too technical here, but I never use the word, you and I are born again. Paul doesn't use that word. Okay? Christ used that word when he talks to Nicodemus. Okay? But the key is, the difference between that. The nation Israel has to be born again. We're going to look at some verses again. But today we are a new man and a new creation. And that takes us back all the way to Adam. 
That's what it's talking about here. Because when we look at this, God, what has taken place that Paul's talking about here, that Paul now offers to all that are fallen in Adam. There's only two people exist in this earth today. You're either in Adam or you're either in Christ. You're either dead in sins or you're a live saint. And Ephesians 2 talks about that. We were dead in sins. Now we are a living saint. That's the only two people that exist today. And he, what this new creation is all about is that we had Adam in his old creation. And he says very clearly here then, Paul is trying to tell us that he offers to take all the fallen sons of Adam and make them a new creation. We are the one new man, which is unique to Paul. But when you get to what, uh, what Christ is talking about being born again, it goes back to the book of Exodus and back to the book of Deuteronomy. So go to, real quickly, we're running out of time, and go to John chapter 3. And we all know the story in John chapter 3. And he's talking to Nicodemus here. And I'm going to read starting in, in, uh, in verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That's a general term. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's wombs and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, that's Ezekiel 36, 25 and 26, ye cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not uh, that I said unto, and this is why the King James Bible is so important, say unto thee, that's singular, and then ye is plural. Ye must be born again, talking about the nation Israel. If you had most other Bibles, it'll just say you. So you would think he's only talking to Nicodemus, but that's why our Bible is so special. Because he says, I say unto thee, singular Nicodemus, ye, the nation Israel, must be born again. And we're not going to go to all the passage, but in Isaiah, in Isaiah 66, 8, it says, can a nation be born in a day. That's exactly what's going to happen to them. When was Israel first born? They went into Egypt as a family. They come out as a nation. That's what it's all about. Now he says that nation must be born again. And the question Isaiah, can a nation be born in one day? Absolutely. At the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So being born again has to do with a nation. They were born once coming out of the land as a nation, they had to be born again when they'll come back into the nation. So one goes back to Deuteronomy 32, 18. You can look it up yourself. I begot you. I'm not going to, we're already out of time. That's why I'm not taking you. Look it up, Deuteronomy 32, 28. So that's the difference between born again and a new creation. I never use that word, but born again. We are a new man and we are a new creation. Israel will be born again. Can a nation be born in a day? Absolutely. So the last thing we're going to talk about to conclude this is God's concerning the body was kept secret since the world began. That is what's new. Peter says everything I'm telling you has been told to you from, by all the prophets from Samuel forth. When Paul talks about this secret body, he says it's been hidden God since before the foundation of the world First revealed to who? To our apostle, the apostle Paul. Father, we just thank you and praise you for the wonderful truth and for our apostle giving us this wonderful message of grace that makes us the one new man and the new creation in Christ. Christ's body, which is his church today, which is a joint body, it has to do with reconciling Jews and Gentiles so that both had to be alienated and become an enemy before you can have this body truth. We just thank you and praise you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.